The document that I'm about to leak is highly controversial and contains restricted information regarding human experiments conducted by the Vatican during World War II. Records of these experiments have languished in the Vatican's secret archive for decades. Given their secrecy, this disclosure represents the first time this information has been shared with the public. What follows is a letter written by a Parisian priest named Father Bonnard, describing the human experiments he performed on American POWs in Arles, France. These experiments were carried out unbeknownst to the Allied forces, and represent a dark pattern of treachery indicative of the Vatican during that time. The letter has been meticulously translated from its original French for readability. Dear Father Corbeck, I can understand why Van Gogh spent so much time painting the art landscape. The sunflower fields are beautiful, and may me regret the excessive time I must spend underground. Given the importance of my work, though, this sacrifice is not only necessary, but desired. I'm making major breakthroughs here. My inquiry is ever hurtling towards its conclusion, which will be so grand that even the Pope himself will sing my praises. In order for you to fully understand my work, I must record the important events of yesterday morning, for they represent my most successful trials yet. My contacts captured and delivered five more American soldiers Sunday, most of them misdropped infantrymen. The Americans are even more sloppy than the British. They roam the countryside in ragtag bunches, lost and objectiveless like mutts abandoned by their masters. God himself couldn't devise better subjects. Given their ignorance of our language, they are easy to trick, and walk bright-eyed and cheery into my contacts' vehicles. You can imagine their surprise when they arrive in R, and are chained to the pipes in my basement, a precaution which I quickly learned to take, but I digress. I began my experiment yesterday morning after giving the Americans a day to adjust to their captured states. They hurled vile insults and spat at me as I descended the stairs which is typical behavior of men from such a vulgar country. Fortunately, I possess a more refined mind and chose to ignore their imbecility rather than retaliate with equally base behavior. Why are you doing this to us, asshole? said Bruce, the unofficial leader of their squad. He had massive biceps and short cropped black hair. I ignored him. I find it wise to avoid conversing with my subjects. They are nothing but vessels. Engaging with them riles them up. It makes it harder to do my work. So I picked up my copy of Rituali Romanum, without saying a word, and returned to my handwritten version of the Inversione di Fortuna, right. The Americans berated me with vile insults as I reviewed my notes. Obscenities poured from their mouths like toxic fumes, and would have filled me with rage had I not been so absorbed by the words in front of me. Although my last performance of the rite had failed miserably, I was confident that I had made the proper changes to the incantation, and prayed that my efforts this time would yield positive results. Disposing of bodies is becoming increasingly difficult. The Arlesians are growing suspicious of their shut-in priest and spy on my every movement, fishing for controversies and spreadable gossip. In order to avoid having to switch towns for the third time this year, I needed to preserve the Americans for as long as I could. I couldn't afford any more catastrophic failures. Tales of violent screams and the reanimated dead were being associated with my basement, and I didn't want the townsfolk to deduce the veracity of these tales, for my work would cause their feeble minds to double over in fear. Hey, prick, said Bruce voice trembling with fear. How about you put away that book and talk to us here? The least we deserve is an explanation of what's going on. Despite my typical rule of avoiding conversations with my subjects, there was something about the way Bruce said this that made me want to respond. His voice had an earnestness to it, atypical of an American in his position. You are about to be exposed to the forces of hell, I said so that I may learn the secrets of heaven. I launched into the Inversione de Fortuna, right, before he had a chance to respond. The Americans convulsed as my words assaulted their ears. 
frothy saliva filled their mouths and went spilling onto their contracting chests. Their convulsions became so great that they started struggling against their chains like wounded animals, sending streams of blood cascading down their wrists. Despite their violent reactions, I continued my recitation of the rite with fervor. These convulsions are normal and represent physical manifestations of their souls being exposed to the forces of hell. Their bodies went limp as their souls flooded from their bodies like water down a drain. Other than the howling of the wind drifting through the floorboards, the room fell silent. As the minutes ticked by and their still bodies remained lifeless, I feared that the trial had failed. Cursing myself for my shortcomings, I closed the Rituali Romanum and steeled myself for the prospect of having to dispose of more corpses. But then, the Americans inhaled raspy breaths and opened their eyes. Much to my delight, their eyes were yellow. My heart quickened as Bruce's yellow eyes locked onto my own. You wear the cloth, he said, and yet you willingly knock on Hell's door. Why is this, priest? His voice had been completely changed by the entity commandeering his spirit. Where once his tone had been coarse and vulgar, it was now smooth and elegant. I could tell that I was conversing with a being vastly wiser than myself. The eyes boring into my flesh were ancient, and exhumed infinite knowledge about good, evil, and ultimate reality. I vowed to extract this knowledge using any means necessary. I summoned you so that I may converse with spirits wiser than myself, I said. Spirits? Bruce laughed. There are no spirits here, only hatred. Your chains are comical, said the soldier to his left. Do you really think that'll protect you from us? He rattled his manacles mockingly against the wall. Uh, the chains are not for you, but for the soldiers in which you inhabit. They are brutish creatures and will slit my throat if given the chance. You fear for the safety of your flesh, said Bruce, grinning, when you should fear for the fate of your soul. I'm of the mind to dine on your spirit now. There's always room in hell for one more priest. Knowing that I needed to remain firm in the face of such threats, I brandished the crucifix dangling from my neck and raised the Rituale Romanum from my side, sending Bruce and his companions writhing against the wall. Making an attempt on my life would be unwise, I said, for in my hands I possess the means of banishing you all back to hell. Given that the land of the living is preferable to the dominion of the dead, I doubt that any of you wish to depart from your newfound vessel. You threaten us, priest, said the soldier to Bruce's right. Hell is our home. I'll gladly return with your flesh between my teeth. My companion speaks the truth, said Bruce. You hold no power over us, so why perform this pathetic charade? Feeling the situation quickly slipping from my control, I thumbed open the Rituale Romanum to the exorcism right. I then began to recite the sprawling Latin with such force my jaw vibrated. Bruce and the other soldiers emanated pain-filled shrieks as my words crashed into them like vials of acid. They struggled against their chains like trapped animals, and shut their eyes so tightly their eyelids wrinkled. One of the soldiers gnashed his teeth with such tenacity he bit off his tongue. Dark blood pooled from his mouth in thick rivulets, trickling down his exposed chest before crashing towards the floor. Eventually, their screams reached such volume that they nearly drowned out my voice. Regardless, I continued reading, for I needed to prove to them that my power was legitimate. <sighs> Enough, roared Bruce, hoarse voice reverberating around the room like a screeching megaphone. Yeah, you've proven your point. Close that blasted book and tell us the reason you've conjured us. For if you utter one more word from that cursed ride, your suffering will be legendary, even in hell. I lowered the book to my side, doing my best to ignore such a spine-chilling comment. 
I want you to answer my questions, I said. There are many questions, or as many as I choose to ask. What will we get in return? In return, I will allow you to remain on earth. Unchained? We unchained. Bruce's eyes glowed like amber in the low light of the candles spaced intermittently around the walls. We accept your offer. Ask us your questions. His ascent filled my veins with adrenaline. Never before had I progressed to this point in my trials. Typically, my subjects died during their possessions. The shock of such vile presences entering their minds caused them to either tear out their throats or smash their heads against the closest wall until their skulls cracked open like rotten pumpkins. To think that I could finally converse with omnipotent entities, no matter how insidious, about the afterlife, caused my heart to gallop. Just the thought of the profound knowledge that they could bestow upon me caused my hands to tremble. God willing, I could become the wisest man on earth, and be the sole possessor of true revelations of heaven and hell. For this reason I needed to proceed carefully. I couldn't afford to slip up. I might not ever receive such a valuable opportunity again. If my previous track record was a valid indicator of future successes, then it might take years, if not decades, for me to reproduce such clean possessions. Given my raging desire for tangible answers, I steeled my nerves and regarded Bruce with serious eyes. I will ask my questions, I said, but first I need assurances that your answers will be truthful. If I sense that you're lying, then I will banish you back to hell. Such a cacophonous laugh exploded from Bruce's mouth that it caused me to retreat a step towards the door. I didn't think that human beings were capable of projecting such a grotesque sound. His vocal cords grated against each other like sandpaper, producing a noise so jarring my ears still ache as I write this. And uh, how should we provide such assurances? said Bruce. Shall we make a blood pact? You'll just have to take our words at face value, priest. <sighs> Fair enough. Now that the opportunity to ask my questions was literally staring me right in the face, Anxiety wrapped its icy fingers around my throat, causing my mind to go blank. The questions that I'd been reflecting on for decades flooded from my memory. All I could do was stand there like an imbecile as Bruce's yellow eyes seared my skin. Eventually, I regained my wits and began my inquiry. Does God exist? I asked. Bruce flashed me a deviant look, then erupted into such a violent fit of laughter that my blood ran cold. The room darkened as Bruce's laughter assaulted my ears. His gaping mouth consumed the candlelight like a black hole, causing the shadows undulating along the walls to elongate into sinister shapes. For the first time since facilitating the soldiers' possessions, I felt my lungs constrict with fear. <laughs> Leave it to a priest to ask such a childish question, said Bruce, laughter reducing from a rolling boil to a dull simmer. Especially one as tainted as you. I stepped forward, fear morphing into anger. Mocking me is not part of our deal, I said. My incredulity sent the remaining soldiers tumbling into deafening laughter. Their voices morphed into a single entity, and berated my ears like minuscule knives hurtling through the air. "'Have we offended you, father?' said the soldier to Bruce's left. Oh, "'Do we need to be punished?' I blushed, despite my efforts to hide my emotions. "'Answer my question, or I will reclaim the gifts I have given you. Don't pretend like you wouldn't prefer to remain inside these Americans.' "'Don't worry.' said Bruce, eyes narrowing. We will answer your questions. Consider our laughter a harmless interlude. Speak then, for my patience is growing thin. Bruce wet his lips with a tongue so dark it was nearly black. 
Uh, your question is more complex than you think, and doesn't have a simple answer. Nonetheless, you must answer it. Remember our agreement. My hands tremble with excitement as Bruce stared at me through the shadows. Although I'd been performing the Inversione de Fortuna ritual for decades, never before had I successfully conjured an entity intelligent enough to answer my questions. To think that I was only moments away from receiving such profound spiritual knowledge quickened my heart. The other soldiers looked at Bruce. Based on their expressions, they appeared even more interested in hearing what his response would be than I was. And for this reason, they fell silent the moment he began talking, and remained still throughout the entirety of our conversation. Your question is ineffable, said Bruce. Such metaphysical insights are incompatible with your language. You're asking me to explain something beyond the comprehension of your feeble mind. Regardless, you must make an attempt. My mind is sharper than you think. Your words will not fall on lame ears. Oh, it's not lame ears I'm worried about, but dumb. Bruce folded his arms across his chest, causing his chains to rattle. I suppose that I can attempt an answer, however crude it may be. That's a wise decision. Your continued existence on earth depends upon your response. Bruce nodded his head. Oh, to put it simply, priest, God exists, but not for humanity. I don't understand. What is there to misunderstand? God turned his back on your species a long time ago. Like a gambler who's invested too much coin on a single losing hand, he pulled his stock from humanity centuries ago. You are a godless race, and will continue to be so until the last human falls stinking into the earth. Do you expect me to take your answer at face value? What evidence do you have to prove such a grandiose claim? Bruce glared at me with eyes so yellow they glow brighter than the candles. I could tell that he was trying to rattle me, but my resolve held firm. The proof is all around you, and yet you're too blind to see it. Thousands of innocent lives are snuffed out daily on this continent, but still God refuses to intervene. This is not by accident. His decision to turn a blind eye is intentional, and reflects a malcontent that has been growing for millennia. I harden my face, doing my best to mask my uneasiness. Our conversation was taking a turn I hadn't expected. I tried to convince myself that Bruce was lying, but then my eyes would snap onto his stolid face, sending all of my doubts about the veracity of his words tumbling down the yellow pits that were his eyes. God's work is a mystery, I said. Nobody, including you, can discern why he's allowed so much evil to flourish in this world. Of course I can said Bruce. He allows cruelty to prevail because he was abandoning your people. Human beings are naturally violent and barbaric. This war is only the most recent manifestation of base behavior stretching back to Cain. God's grown weary of being exploited by such ungrateful creations. He has washed his hands of humanity and now solely focuses on cultivating the kingdom of heaven. If I am to believe that God has truly abandoned humanity, then I need to know the exact incident that has caused such a damning decision. Surely there must be one, for otherwise his decision is arbitrary and incompatible with his divine nature. The uh, inciting incident, as you call it, was when your people murdered his only son. He sent Jesus to raise up humanity, not fall victim to his most heinous act, and although he has forgiven your kind for such a cruel betrayal, he is not forgotten. The crucifixion of Jesus marks the moment that God relinquished his hold on mankind. He has allowed your species to fester ever since. Anger swelled within me, despite my desire to keep a level head. Bruce's words were blasphemy. How could God abandon his own children? The thought was inconceivable. It certainly couldn't be true. 
my mind reeled as a lifetime of faith crumbled under Bruce's gaze. Were my Catholic beliefs truly defunct? Had God truly left us to languish in our cruel and deceitful ways? I couldn't stomach the thought. I couldn't imagine living in a world void of God's grace. Think about it, Father, said Bruce, grinning. The Bible is overflowing with accounts of God's presence on this earth. Tell me then, why isn't his presence felt any more? Why doesn't he tangibly intervene in human affairs like he did for Moses or Noah? Why has his voice grown silent? <sighs> you are lying, I said, voice trembling with rage. No, I should never have trusted you to aid my inquiry. Bruce opened his mouth to respond, but his words never reached my ears, for I had already torn open the Rituali Romanum and launched a voice booming, into the exorcism rites. The rattling of chains reverberated throughout the chamber as the soldiers writhed against the wall. My words crashed into them like tsunami waves and left them gasping for air. Their guttural pants mixed with the efficacious words of the exorcism rite, filling the room with rebounding echoes that raised my ears like cannon blasts. Their eyes widened as their limbs contorted into unnatural angles. Blood exploded from their wrists as they yanked against their cuffs, sending crimson streaks pouring down their hands. Bruce managed to lock his eyes onto mine, despite the spasm shooting down his neck like shockwaves. Our agreement is now broken, he said, voice hoarse. Your soul will forever languish in the deepest pits of hell. I ignored this threat and continued the exorcism. Latin spewed from my mouth in chaotic streams, forcing the soldiers against the wall like trapped animals. Their yellow eyes quivered with fear as I took a step forward, rituale romanum, stretched out in front of me like a bloodthirsty hound. The soldiers doubled over in pain as my voice swelled. Never before had my voice felt so strong. My vocal cords vibrated with such power that for a moment I feared they might explode through my neck. Fortunately, they held true, and perfect Latin continued leaping from my mouth like paratroopers hurtling towards their targets. Although the intensity of my words persisted, Bruce straightened. It was as if an invisible barrier was being erected around him, weakening the effect of the exorcism. He grinned as he unfurled his arms, which had been tightly wrapped around his body, regarded me with a look of such disdain I nearly stumbled over my words. The truth is painful, isn't it, priest? said Bruce. Your faith is decaying. I can sense it. The bodies of two of the soldiers went limp. Unlike previous exorcisms I'd performed, they did not regain consciousness, but instead slumped lifelessly to the floor like overfilled ragdolls. Their souls are being consumed, said Bruce, tracking my eyes. Hell is their home now. As it will be yours once more, I said. You don't frighten me, Legion. God has complete power over you, and I am his vessel. You are no more God's vessel than I am. Your father has abandoned you along with the rest of your kind. Christianity is nothing but a hollow shell. Given how close this shell is to cracking, corrupt priests like yourself were the first to succumb to society's rage. Be silent. Your words fall on deaf ears. My will is stronger than you make it out to be. I will not so easily fall into despair. My voice echoed off the walls like a cracking whip as I continued the exorcism. Sweat poured down my face in streams and crashed onto the yellow pages of the Rituali Romano. Bruce glared at me as my words barreled into him like a physical force. Hatred radiated from his yellow eyes in sinister waves, and would have caused me to recoil if I wasn't so focused on sending him screaming back to hell. Adrenaline exploded through my veins as two more soldiers slumped to the ground. Just like their comrades, they remained lifeless. The sight of their blackened tongues spilling over their pale lips like slices of rotten meat filled me with disgust. How unfortunate, 
said Bruce. They're weaker than I thought. Your kind is always weak when faced with God's wrath. Bruce laughed. Yeah, your piety is amusing. You act as if your soul isn't tainted beyond repair. I know all about your past, Bernard. And I can assure you God has reserved a special place in hell for men like you. I tightened my grip on the Rituali Romanum. You lie, I said. Everything I have done has stemmed from my desire for wisdom. My inquiry has grown me closer to God, not driven me from His grace. Yeah, the only grace you have received is the continued permission to draw breath. Your life is unnatural, priest. Your very existence blasphemes God's commandments. <sighs> it is you that blasphemes God. Did you think that I would honestly believe your tale? The notion that God would abandon his children is ludicrous. Although humanity is far from perfect, we are still made in God's image. Just like any good shepherd, God will never abandon his flock, no matter how wayward they become. Not only has God abandoned his flock, but he has willingly thrown them to the wolves. Hell awaits every soul that draws breath, from the kindest woman to the weakest child. The gates of heaven are permanently closed to your kind. You can attack my faith all you want. My piety is unshakable and is built on a stable foundation of wisdom and reverence. If God cared enough about you to listen to your words, his thunderous laughter would overpower even my own. It's going to take words much more persuasive than that to tell me from my faith. Ah, fair enough. It's just you and I now, but not for long. When my companion arrives, you will understand the perilous situation you've wrought upon yourself. What companion? Bruce grinned. Oh, he's known by many names. Currently, he goes by Claudius. I took a step forward, brandishing my crucifix. The close proximity of the holy relic burned Bruce's skin and sent him careening back towards the wall. You're lying, I said. You would never reveal your plans to me, and besides, even if this Claudius is coming, I will have already cast your soul back to hell by the time he arrives. The trapdoor of the basement flew open and crashed against the hardwood floor. Are you sure about that, father? I turned my head just in time to see a boy no older than fourteen descend the ladder. His yellow eyes were filled with so much malice my throat seized. So hypnotic were his eyes that a desolate numbness overtook my body, causing the Rituali Romanum to tumble from my hands and crash to the floor. The thumping sound of the Rituali Romanum emanated as it struck the ground, jolting me back to reality. Who are you? I said, tearing the gaze from the boy's hypnotic eyes. What is your purpose here? I can ask you the same thing, priest, said the boy. His voice was ageless and slithered through the air with unnatural volume. Ah, he wishes to learn the secrets of the afterlife, said Bruce. And like Faustus, his conjured force is far greater than he can control. Ah, is that so? The boy strode across the chamber and paused in front of Bruce. The moment he noticed the chains binding him to the wall, he grinned. Ah, this is quite the spectacle. He wrapped his hands around the chains and tore them from the wall. The ease with which he did this shocked me. It was as if he possessed the strength of twenty men. I coughed as dust cascaded from the ruined wall and filled the chamber. You're free now, said the boy. Always remember who it was that freed you. Repaying your debt will be an arduous process, but one that will reward you greatly. Bruce kneeled in front of the boy and bowed his head. Yes, master, he said. Your will is my command. The sight of Bruce supplicating himself in front of this strange child filled me with dread. What hidden powers must the boy possess to command such respect from an omnipotent entity? 
For the first time that morning, I felt the situation slipping from my control. Now that Bruce was free, there was nothing stopping him from tearing out my throat, or beating my head against the wall until my skull caved in. My body and soul were at his disposal. He could do anything to me that he wanted. I shudder to think of what vile tortures his devious mind could concoct. This thought caused my heart rate to triple. Regardless, I remained outwardly calm. Succumbing to fear would only hasten my demise. If I wanted to escape the situation with my life, then I needed to funnel my energy into developing a plan. As I stood there staring at the insidious entities before me, a thick fog blanketed my mind and consumed my ideas with icy tendrils. I felt like a helpless child. I could no more combat the evilness lurking before me than I could summon God to do my bidding. They were just too powerful, and surpassed my skill as an exorcist. Well, the boy must have been able to sense my terror, for he flashed me such an amused and sinister look that my hand started trembling. "'What's the matter, priest?' said the boy, yellow eyes stroking my flesh like over-sharpened knives. "'Isn't this what you wanted? It's your desire for wisdom that brought us here. Aren't you glad to see us?' The boy's mocking tone sent Bruce erupting into a violent fit of laughter. <sighs> "'Still reeling from our discussion, are you?' he said. "'That's what's wrong with priests.' They shrink away from reality like a hand approaching an inferno. All of you have your own agendas. Your inquiry is a facade, a vain attempt to mask your true desire, gaining power over others. I stared down at my feet. How will you respond, Bernard? Is this not your true aim? I stepped backwards as Bruce and the boy walked towards me on shadow-covered feet. Uh, you will not intimidate me into discourse, I said. I still don't even know who you are. Oh, I'm known by many names. In your language, I'm known as Claudius. I turned the name over in my mind. I'd heard terrible tales of a Claudius wreaking havoc in Paris, but had never confirmed the veracity of these tales. Was this boy truly capable of committing the horrors that I'd heard about? The legends of his unspeakable crime spread like wildfire throughout the countryside. Before yesterday, I thought these legends to be nothing but fiction, but after seeing the boy with my own eyes, I'm no longer sure. You're familiar with my name, said Claudius, taking another step forward. Your face betrays your fear. I've uh, heard rumors. And do you believe these rumors? No more than I believe God has abandoned his children. Ah, spoken like a true priest. Only, you're not a true priest, are you, Father? You're an imposter, a fraud. Your faith is weak, just like your tainted motivation. Claudius took another step towards me. Now that he was only a few feet away, his hypnotic gaze threatened to rob me of my consciousness. Your beliefs matter not. He continued, Only pain exists where you're going. Oh, pain and despair. I'm not going anywhere with you, I said, voice sounding weak even to my own ears. The closer Claudius crept towards me, the more drained I felt, as if approaching proximity was robbing me of my life force. You don't have a choice, said Claudius. I own you, Bernard. Your soul belongs to me. Your screams will fill the halls of hell for an eternity. I took another step back. He was close enough to touch me now. Just the thought of his hands upon my skin turned my stomach. I cursed myself for so easily losing my resolve. No agent of hell, regardless of how malicious, should be able to weaken my fate. Your time on this earth has come to an end said Claudius. Your corruption has been allowed to fester for too long. It's time that you receive the punishment that you've spent a lifetime accruing. 
The sight of Claudius's hand reaching through the shadows towards my head snapped me out of my stupor. I lunged forward, dodging his fetid fingers and scooped up the Rituali Romanum from the floor. Oh, it is you that is corrupt, I said, tearing open the yellow pages. Your words do not intimidate me. I will drive your twisted presence from that poor child's flesh like poison from a wound. I launched into the exorcism right before Claudius had a chance to respond, voice ricocheting around the chamber with such force that dust rained down from the ceiling. The thundering Latin of the exorcism right caught Claudius off guard and sent him tumbling towards the ruined wall behind him. He placed his hands just in time to prevent his head from exploding against the jagged stone. Eyes bulging with pain as the sharp rock sliced open his palms and sent black blood splashing to the floor. He opened his mouth to speak. The deafening volume of my voice caused him to shut it moments later, morphing his lips into a rictus snarl. I saw Bruce charging me out of the corner of my eye. His silent feet sent a fresh wave of dust billowing around the chamber and caused a sordid haze to descend over the yellow light drifting in from the candle. I raised my crucifix just as he was about to sink his teeth into my neck. The close proximity of the holy relic sent him plummeting to the ground. Smoke billowed from his paws as he writhed in the dust, darkening the muck already spinning through the air with its nauseating ochre. Bruce screamed as black blisters covered his arms. These blisters looked infected and filled the chamber with a rancid odour. Adrenaline erupted through my veins at the sight of his pain and confusion. Only moments ago I'd feared that he would tear out my throat and drag my soul to hell. To think that I, that God, had the power to defeat such a malevolent entity quickened my heart. But then Claudius raised his hand and pinched my throat shut with an invisible force, sending my newfound confidence rupturing into oblivion. This charade has gone on long enough, said Claudius, voice two tones deeper than the last time he'd spoken. Your performance of the exorcism rite is nothing but a pantomime, an attempt to evoke the power of a god that has long since abandoned you. Faith will not save you from your fate, father, especially faith tainted with doubt and despair. My face contorted with pain as my lungs deflated. I felt like a pair of claws was constricting my organs, and would have screamed had my throat not been sealed off by the invisible substance. No matter how hard I tried to gulp air down my burning throat, my lungs remained empty. My face turned a sickly purple as my lungs withered, darkening my vision. Never before had I felt such pain. Embrace your suffering, said Claudius, face dominated by a sardonic grin for pain will soon be your undying companion. What you're experiencing now is only a small taste of what you will experience in hell. The tortures that I will inflict upon you will become notorious and cause even demons to tremble. My body convulsed from oxygen deprivation, sending me crashing to the ground. Dust filled my mouth as my face landed face first on the wood. I listened as a pair of feet slithered across the floor and stopped beside me. Where is your god, Bernard? said Claudius. You are one with his disciples. Shouldn't he be protecting you? He kicked me in the stomach and sent the little oxygen that remained inside my body pouring from my gasping mouth. Shouldn't he strike me dead where I stand? He kicked me again. Here I am ending your blasphemous life, and yet God does not intervene. That's not by accident. He has condemned you, just like every other priest corrupting his name. I rolled over onto my back and panted with such force my ribs groaned. I could feel death wrapping its icy fingers around my throat and shuddered. Your time on earth has come to an end. Your soul's journey through hell is long overdue. I flailed my arms as he straddled my body and wrapped his hands around my throat. 
our eyes locked, and his hypnotic gaze filled my limbs with a stinging numbness that caused my arms to fall lifelessly to my sides. Don't struggle, said Claudius, voice an insidious whisper. Your soul is already mine. My eyes rolled as a blinding redness consumed my vision. This redness felt evil and alive, as if it were a living organism. The redness receded as images of a pit blacker than death overcame my mind. Millions of bodies were languishing in this pit, limbs broken and eyes gouged. Their twisted screams echoed endlessly through the air as this pit momentarily consumed their faces and scalded their skin before spitting them back out further up the chasm. On a cliff overlooking this pit was a jagged castle made of black obsidian. Its twisted spires towered menacingly into the starless yellow sky and vibrated incessantly from the guttural screams exploding from the chasm. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair, ran Claudius's voice in the distance. He sounded miles away, even though his mouth was no more than six inches from my ears. The longer I gazed upon his foreboding castle, the further from my body I felt. My aching lungs had become a distant memory. I was formless and destined for an eternity of suffering in the pit spiraling beneath my feet. Welcome to your new home, priest. This hellish world became realer with each passing second. I could hardly sense my body, nor see Claudius's eyes hovering above my own. The chaotic pit was all that existed, and my mind reeled as it beckoned me with open arms. As my spirit continued to fade from my body, I offered up a desperate prayer to God to save me from such unbearable torture. It was while midway through my prayer that I remember the cross dangling from my neck. Feeling my courage return, I summoned what remained of my strength and threw my right arm towards my collar. I smiled as cool metal greeted my hand. I tightened my fingers around the cross, tore it from my neck, and stabbed it into Claudius's eye. He let out such a violent shriek of pain that my eardrums burst. I hardly noticed this wound, though for I was too busy filling my lungs with air as my soul ascended from the pit's precipice and re-entered my body. You ignorant bastard, roared Claudius, black blood oozing down his cheek in thick streams. I shot to my feet just as he started lunging towards me. My crucifix connected with his forehead and melted through his flesh like a hot knife slicing a stick of butter. Fetid steam billowed from his wound, and seared my eyes with particles of charred skin. Claudius shot backwards and stumbled over Bruce's legs, who crawled over to the ruined wall to nurse the wounds of his arms. After yelling at each other in an evil-sounding language, they bolted to their feet and retreated towards the trap door. Don't think that you've won, Bernard, said Claudius. We'll be back, and next time, luck will not save you. Before I could open my mouth to respond, they climbed through the trap door with unnatural speed and disappeared from the house. The last thing I heard before falling unconscious was the whispering wind of the Arles countryside, which cascaded through the still swinging front door in steady bursts. I imagined this breeze through the sound of angels singing. <sighs> I started writing this letter the moment I regained consciousness preserving the accuracy of the, my experiences of the utmost importance, for it provides the church with an unprecedented view of the afterlife. Words can hardly describe how eager I am to continue my experiments. Yesterday's trials have renewed my interest in the Inversione de Fortuna ritual. I refuse to listen to Claudius's revelations about heaven. Down that path lies only despair and the potential to demolish our faith. Instead... I'm more confident than ever that my inquiry will yield positive results. And here's why. As I ascended from the hellish pit after stabbing Claudius in the eye, another vision briefly overtook me. The vision was of an opulent realm, filled with bright white light and smiling faces, which filled me with such peace I tremble just thinking about it. 
What might this realm be other than heaven? I'm determined to find the answers to this question, for in this realm lies the secrets of our religion. I'm sure of it. For this reason, I will redouble my efforts. I'll update you as I make my progress on this front, and as I grow ever closer to summoning the fathers of the church. Until then, you have my best regards. Your friend, Father Claude Bonnard. Well, I have to say, I'm a terrible, terrible judge of um, what exactly it is you guys want to listen to on this channel, but I think that is exactly the kind of story that you all love. If that's the case, then please let me know, because um, I've been chatting with the author for quite a while now. Uh, we've been developing something of a working relationship, and um, he's doing some phenomenal work. Really, really good writing, quality of the highest standard, and it's an absolute joy for me to read. So, um... If you enjoy that, please let me know, because I'd uh, like to do much more of his work. And um, I think we're going to enjoy working together, me and him. And of course, if it's to your liking, even better. So please, comments in the comments section below. Let me know how much you love that story, and if you want me to continue doing more of his work. Fantastic. And of course, I've uh, left details of his channel in the uh, video description. Please go there. He's uh, narrating his own stories as well. Up and coming young channel, so... Go and give him some love, comment, like, subscribe, all the regular stuff. Go on, go on, do me a little favour, it's not too much to ask, is it? Of course not. Well, my dear friends, that's enough for me for one evening, but I will be back again very, very soon. Till then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music, and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>